What's going on, Bulls Nation? Welcome in to the CHGO Bulls Podcast. Coming to you live on Wednesday afternoon. I'm Pack Bulls underscore Pack, joined by my crew, Big Dave Bow, BAWL Sports. Hey, Billy's <laughs> picking my nose yeah. right now. Thanks, Billy. Will the go golly, Will underscore golly. And sitting in for Joe today, it's our friend, our producer, Kevin Wells, on the controls. What's up, Kev? What's up, boys? Good to be with Wells. you again. <laughs> Wells. Nah, I like how he just says that. Yeah. Nah, Those hat you're rocking, man. Hey, thanks, dude. New one. The Instagram ad got me. I had to do oh. it. Oh, man. well, yeah. It, it happens those, that way. Those Instagram ads, they get all of us. Big big win for the Cubbies. Bouncing back uh, out west last night. Yeah, excited to do a little post game with the guys in a bit here. Uh, nice five forty start. Luke Stuckmeyer loves that. Ooh, uh, love that. Yeah, <laughs> go for a series win, man. Go for a series win. to be eight and four. I uh, I tuned into the Cubs uh, cruise post game show last night after I got back home from our post game show, and sweet sweet Stucky, that man looked like an, a cranky <laughs> grandpa who did not want to be awake that late at night. <laughs> they were doing post game at like twelve thirty a.m. Should have seen him in the chat. He goes, "Just start the damn show." It's eleven forty five. Oh man! Anytime I think I'm getting too old and cranky, I'm just like. Stucky still holds that scepter. That's true. <laughs> and they're winning. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I feel like exactly. that, right? <laughs> uh, Bulls are off today uh, before they're back to back against the Pistons and Wizards on Thursday and Friday. Uh, but still plenty to talk about today. Wanted to take a look at the latest uh, movement in the Eastern Conference playoff and play in standings. Uh, still just Boston and Milwaukee uh, in the East uh, having clinched a top six spot. Uh, Boston one, obviously Milwaukee two. Still a lot up in the air in these final days before the NBA's regular season finale on Sunday. Also talk a little bit about if the Bulls get past Atlanta in that 9-10 game, which of these teams that might end up there, Philly, Miami, maybe the Pacers, if they slip down from six where they are now, could present the Bulls' greatest opportunity to actually win that second playing game and find themselves uh, find their way to the actual playoffs as that eighth seed. Mm -hmm. And then are going to wrap up today taking a look at what Billy Donovan might have to be forced to do should we be missing Andre Drummond for these last few games of the regular season and maybe even their play-in game. Um, Will, I think I saw an update on Twitter from Casey earlier today that he is listed as doubtful for their game tomorrow. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. Uh, doubtful with an ankle sprain. So, um, you know, we haven't heard anything official from the team or from any other national reporters, but I uh, have to assume he's probably going to miss a little bit of time here. But the fact that there's not like anything Achilles related, anything calf related, like that's it's seeming like that's good news for now, at least. Yeah, uh, especially considering we, we you know, heard that he left the UC <clears throat> in, a, in a boot and on a scooter last night. So we'll uh, we'll pin, put a pin in that for now. We'll come back, circle back to that conversation about what Billy's rotation might look like without Drummond uh, if he is forced to miss some time. But first, let's take a look at what's going on with these Eastern Conference standings. If you want to throw up that graphic that the NBA's Twitter account posted last night after all the games were completed, Kev, thank you. So there you see, obviously, the Celtics running away with it, uh, having clinched the best record in the NBA. Milwaukee, just a game ahead of the Knicks for that two seed uh, after the Knicks got the win over the Bulls last night. The Knicks, in doing so, leapfrogged the Orlando Magic. Um, so much still to be decided. Uh, Cavs at five, Pacers at six. As it stands right now, the Sixers and Heat would play each other in the 7-8 game. And then, of course, we know that Bulls and Hawks will play the 9-10. We just don't know where, as of yet, Bulls have a game lead for home court. Um, the uh, the action for tonight, uh, also definitely something to keep an eye on because the Cavs, Cavs are active. They're hosting the Grizzlies, so that probably looks like it could be a Cleveland win. Maybe they... Still have a shot to get home court in the first round. The Heat, meanwhile, hosting the Dallas Mavericks, uh, who I believe are on the second night of a back-to-back. And then the Magic are at Milwaukee, taking on the Bucks, who we just learned earlier today, will be without Giannis for the remainder of their regular season slate uh, because of that calf injury that forced him out of their game. So, gentlemen, when you look at these standings and say, okay, just for the sake of this discussion, the Bulls find their way past the Atlanta Hawks. They get Trey Young back. Maybe that increases the Bulls' odds of getting past the Atlanta Hawks because the Bulls always seem to play well and give Trey Young fits. Mm -hmm. Is there a team that, to either of you, say 
the Bulls actually have a real shot to beat this team. One win, one game, win or go home. Obviously, you you know, the assumption is you're afraid of Embiid and the Sixers in that second play in game. The Bulls did uh, go two and one against the Sixers this season, and only one of those wins was a game in which the Sixers were without Embiid. They did beat them with Embiid one time this season. We also saw the Bulls lose to the scrappy Jimmy Buckets led Heat in the second playing game last season. I don't know if it's that big of a gap as far as which team you would rather face, which team, you know, a, a Bulls fan who wants to see them win their way out of play in tournament, uh, unlike myself, play in that second game. Dave, what, what are you looking mm -hmm. at and what, what are you thinking right now when you see these uh, playing standings? Um, I think everything you said is, is pretty on the head, except for the afraid part and not really fearing none of these squads. Um, I'm, I don't care who they play, but who would I want to play? I'd rather play the Heat. And it's not because to duck the Sixers. It's just I like Bulls Heat in a postseason game, in a, in a one-off. Um, especially just how that last game they played to play in kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because they actually had a shot to actually win that game. Um, and it sounds crazy because I'm talking about the team that went to the finals <laughs> last year. That represented – of the Eastern Conference in the NBA Finals. Uh, but in a one-off game, anything could kind of happen. And playing against the Heat, it's weird how I think the Bulls and the Heat always match up against each other. It's always a grinded-out kind of game when they play. Um, I think I, saw, I think I said that to Will um, when we were talking about this last time, how when they play, it's always a 90s East game uh, when they play each other. Like, it ends up 94-92 or 96 to 90 or you know just some kind of score like that and it's nobody really does some does what they do well when they play each other like the heat usually might have a bunch of shooters or duncan robinson go crazy and he doesn't do that you know or jimmy butler dropped 35 and he doesn't do that or demar derozan have that big old game and you know he doesn't do that and they just kind of grind it out against each other in a, in a postseason game so i would kind of rather see that for my uh sensibility sake I don't I don't think I don't have the Bulls winning that game, but I would rather see that one just because uh I'm old school and I and I just kind of like that rivalry of of a Bulls Heat uh matchup. Yeah, that makes sense. I think with you know the way that the standings are now with the Sixers and the Heat as the seven and eight seeds, I would prefer Miami just because, like you said, Matt, I want to stay away from Embiid. Like I think the Bulls are in a lot of these games because you know they can keep it close. And then at the end of the game, they have probably the better player and they have, give themselves a chance to win that way. But if you go up in a series against or in a single game elimination against a team that clearly has the best player on the court, like I'm always mm -hmm. going to probably lean towards that player. I think that's just the advantage you have there. So if it's between those teams, I'm leaning obviously Miami over Philly, but the way the standings are right now, I mean, it really could be any of these teams. I think with the exception of the Bucks, and that one's even tight with Giannis going down and they've got uh, three tough games coming up here, but obviously the Knicks are in good position in third right now, a game up, uh, but the magic, the Cavs and the Pacers all have 46 wins and the Pacers and the Cavs are not doing so hot of late. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the Cavs in particular are really kind of falling off a cliff. So I think there's a world where the Cavs fall into the seven, eight game, you know, the Sixers or heat jump them wow. and then the bulls get the Cavs. And I think that would be, best case scenario right now because they've just beaten the Cavs. They've shown they can do that. They also are playing against a team that's like playing some of their worst basketball um, that has spacing issues with two bigs. They haven't really kind of figured things out the way that you kind of need to at this point in the season. So uh, the Pacers are another good matchup. I feel like the Bulls really kind of have their number at this point. Uh, Halliburton has not been the same coming back from that hamstring injury. They have not really found their offensive groove after trading Buddy Heald and bringing in Siakam. Spacing is a little bit more clunky, not as much three-point shooting, not as much dynamic transition offense. So I think this is kind of the argument that AK has been making this whole time, which is there's a, there's a couple of teams that are clearly better than the Bulls. You have, you know, in a one game or a playoff series, you're not going to beat the Bucks. You're not going to beat the Celtics. Um, you're probably not going to beat the Sixers when fully healthy. But I feel like they think they can compete with the Pacers, the Heat, the Magic, the Knicks, um, you know, the the Cavaliers certainly in in a one game or a seven game series uh and they feel pretty good about their chances there so maybe we disagree maybe not but like 
and maybe they're just like a slightly better team in the regular season, but in the playoffs, it becomes a little bit closer. But I think that's kind of the argument here is like, if they can just get the right matchup and they feel comfortable against some of these teams, then, you know, they, they feel like they can get in. I mean, I get the notion that NBA players uh, as a collection, you know, uh, as a team always have that, hey, we feel like we could beat anybody if we play at our best on any given night. Um, you know, you never know kind of thing. But if the Bulls think they could beat Orlando, I'm sorry, they're just wrong. They got swept by the Magic this season. 0-4, they're a terrible matchup for these Bulls. You, you mentioned Cleveland and Indiana as teams that could still theoretically slide into that play-in tournament, and, and you know, and that is possible. Three through eight in the East are all separated by, I think, three games with three games to go, basically. But the Bulls went one and three against the Cavs. They did go three and one against the Pacers. So, you know, probably looking at a, a, a high-scoring game with not a whole lot of defense being played, maybe if the Bulls knock down their threes, they've got a shot uh, against the Pacers. The interesting thing, though, that I'm looking at with – as it stands now, and if it is Philly in Miami, and then the Bulls playing the loser of that game, they they split two and two against Miami this season. As I mentioned before, they went two and one against Philly. One of the wins with Embiid, one without. But the last time they played the Sixers was January second. Hmm. The last time they played the Heat, the fourth and final time, was December sixteenth. <laughs> so, like, when you're looking at what these matchups between Bulls and Sixers or Bulls and Heat might look like, we're, we're talking months ago. There's a lot that has changed for the Bulls and both of those squads between now and then. Who's in, who's out? Uh, you, you know, like, wh what are these matchups going to look like? What's Billy's rotation going to look like compared to months ago when, that, when the Bulls were a very different team? And a much yeah. better team, I would add. Like, the Bulls were playing yeah. some of their best basketball in early – early to mid-January, late December, kind of through February, through the mm -hmm. trade deadline. That's when they kind of hit their stride. They have not been the same team since. There's three and seven in, in their last 10 games. They're kind of falling apart here due to the injuries, due to the fatigue, um, whereas some of these other teams are kind of hitting their stride. And obviously, you know, the Cleveland and the Pacers of the world are kind of in the same boat as the Bulls. But you mentioned the the Magic. Like, I, I don't think the Bulls could beat the Magic in a series. I don't think they could beat them in a one-game playoff. They've proven four times this year that they couldn't beat them. But I think my point is like when you put them up into a playoff postseason type of atmosphere, you bet on the experience that you have with DeMar DeRozan against the, you know, relatively inexperienced players that they have with Boncaro and, and Wagner. But I still don't think this team is good enough to beat any of these teams, like in a seven game series. That's just my opinion. Uh, but in a one game, like who knows? It's There's so much variance involved. And I think, you know, this is probably something that we can get into for a larger discussion, but like, that's why to me, like whatever happens in this playoff series in this play in series should not like determine the future of the bulls. Cause it's one game with a ton of variants when we have three years worth of information about what the ceiling of this team is. And just in the event that you do win these two playing games, you get the prize of going against the Celtics in the first round. So this is just a tough situation. And, you know, I think there are some favorable matchups, some less, uh, less favorable than others, but this is just a tough kind of situation for the Bulls to be in. And I think, you know, touting this as like some big success and getting into the AC is kind of missing the point. Yeah, I don't think it changes how any of us feel or any of how most Bulls fans feel. Yeah. Uh, I just want to see my team win. Well, I, I know what I'm looking at. I know who they are. I, it's not going to change anything. I'm, so I'm not going to immediately just be, hey, don't do nothing, guys. We got it. Like, that's not going to change. But Wanting to see my team win, I absolutely want that. That's that's a thing <laughs> that that I want to happen. Um, I agree with you as far as who they're not beating any of these games and any of these teams in the seven game series. That's just not going to happen. Uh, they're gonna get they're gonna get stomped most likely, um, especially Orlando. Oh my god, <laughs> they they match up horribly as Matt mentioned uh, against Orlando. They they don't I don't think they have a prayer uh, in that series. Um, but in a one game in a one game situation where anything could truly happen. You got a shot to do anything. Again, this is kind of what the NBA wanted when they wanted to play in a game, a one-game mm -hmm. scenario that matches the, the intensity and why people love March Madness kind of thing. One game, you got one shot. There it is. It doesn't matter who you are, how bad you are. You got one shot to do something. Here's your shot. So they're trying to match that aspect. And if we're just putting it down on that, Anything can happen. That's like a pickup game, Will. Like if somebody has been winning seven straight on on the on the court, you know what I mean. One team could come in and knock you off, you know. And they don't have to be better than you, or they don't have to have more shooting than you, or whatever. It could just because you're tired of winning seven straight games. You know what I mean? Like it, that could be the case. So 
it could be the case for the Bulls. They could do these things. I see. I think but all of us kind of see them maybe winning one, maybe, but I'm not going uh, too much further than that. Um, do I want them to go further than me? Yes, absolutely. I want to go to the playoffs. But I don't see them going any further after that. These teams are too tough. Boston's too tough, man. Milwaukee, even without Giannis, is still too tough. Uh, even though that'd be a better matchup uh, for the Bulls than it would be against uh, Boston. Um, but yeah, like I, that's interesting because I honestly, Will, didn't even think of the fact that Cleveland could fall completely out of this and get down to that play-in level, which is a huge possibility, which is crazy. Like nothing is really set from three to eight. Only two things are set in the East, <laughs> the Bulls <laughs> and, and the top two seeds and, and the Hawks. And that's it. And everything else is kind of up for grabs, man. And this is kind of why I love the playoff time. Everything else is kind of up for grabs. And you know, but you just honestly don't know. It is uh, – there is a certain level of excitement that's been added to it. Um, I, I want to kind of zoom out a little bit and have a, a, a continuation of this conversation about what the NBA has accomplished with the playing tournament and maybe some of the negative side effects for these teams – like the Bulls who are kind of stuck in the middle and maybe in, in some aspect being rewarded for being stuck in the middle. Um, so we can do that on the other side of this first ad break. While we are doing that, you know what to do. Hit that like button if you're hanging out with us on YouTube. We appreciate you hanging out with us. Make sure you also subscribe to the CHO Sports YouTube channel. Today's CHO Bulls brought to you by our friends at Salerno's Pizza. Um, wow. Shout out to them for sponsoring uh, Big Dave and the Hawks crew and Ryan from Cubs and their fun CHGO WrestleMania watch along last weekend. Uh, they also, of course, are our sponsor for our CHGO Tavern style episodes every Monday through Thursday. Uh, <laughs> shout, shout out to Carmen Sean, who we're discussing on today's Tavern style, uh, brought to you by Solar Knows whether or not uh, the Bulls having themselves a play in tournament uh, game is something Chicago fans <laughs> should be excited about. <laughs> uh, but either way, whether it's the Bulls play-in game next week or, hey, shout-out to the Masters, which start tomorrow, Jim Nance mm -hmm. and friends. You can watch that, any other friends. sporting events you want when you go hang out and eat some of that delicious pizza at Salerno's, their Grand Avenue location in Chicago. You can call them for an order of carryout or delivery as well as dining in. You can call them at 312-666-3444 or go to salernospizza.com for more information. Also, Mention CHGO and you can get half off your pizza. Dave, mm. what was your favorite pizza uh, from Salerno's that you guys ate last last Saturday? I mean, obviously the veggie one. <laughs> obviously, that's the one I was chowing down on. Yeah, it was delicious, man. Shout All out to pizza. them. Yeah, they made it just how I wanted it. You know what I mean? Put the spinach on there right. You know, put the mushrooms on there right. You know, a little black olive on there. Like, it was, it was on point. I really enjoyed it. Uh, they, they do have just some of the best tavern style pizza in the city. I think Salerno's is delicious yeah. again, you know, they've also got some, uh, locations uh, around the Chicago suburbs, but if you are in Chicago and want to go hang out at their Salerno's location on grand Avenue to watch some sports this coming weekend, uh, maybe the bulls playing game next Tuesday or Wednesday, uh, just show up, dine in, have a wonderful time. You could also call them for carry out. Or delivery orders again. That's 312 666 3444 or salernospizza.com. Mention CHGO. Get yourself a discount on that delicious Salerno's pizza. Mm. Anytime I think of pizza, I think of chilling. So when I'm eating that pizza, I need something else to help me chill with that. And that is Coors Light, ladies and gentlemen. They help you find your chill when you're looking for it, when you're sitting on the remote show, chilling. And in, in this glass right here is some water. And the other glass I got behind it is not. <laughs> it's that frosty cold, cold beverage, ladies and gentlemen. And that is how you find your chill. So however you find it, Coors Light is the one you should be picking up to help you enhance it and find it if you ain't found it yet. So whether your team is stressing you out or it's just life in general, things can feel a little bit chaotic. And that's why Coors Light helps you find moments to chill all year long, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I love it so much. Just refreshing once it hits your lips. When the blue, when the mountains turn blue, it's as cold as the Rockies. Coors Light is cold lagered, cold filtered, and cold packaged for a smoother finish. When it's time to chill, open the Coors Light. It's a mountain cold refreshment, and it's as crisp and refreshing as the Colorado Rockies. Not the team, but the actual Colorado Rockies, ladies and gentlemen. 
So when it's time to chill, Coors Light is the beer that we reach for. Get Coors Light delivered straight to your door via Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash CHGO basketball. That's CoorsLight.com slash CHGO basketball. It's Coors Light. Find your chill. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Light Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. Will, do not wear that hat in when you go get some beer, dog. They're going to think you under 21. Yeah, I was going to say. You, do that, I don't know dog. why wearing a baseball cap makes you look so young. But well, I swear he got, he got a paper route somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact, Will Gottlieb, actually a background actor in the movie Newsy. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the sandlot. I know I saw him in there. <laughs> All right, guys. So. This NBA playing tournament thing, it's been going on for a few years now. When, when did it start? The 2021 season? 21, 22? I think technically they started it, a version of it in the bubble, but then the first year right. where it's, uh, you know, this version of it, it right. was after right. that. But So the, you know, the following a, shortened 72 game season, 2021, was like the first right. real play. So that's what, three years worth? And this uh, is yeah. the third year. Um, okay. And in that time, I think it was Mark Stein who had this on Twitter the other day that I saw. Supposedly, there are already 18 of the 30 NBA teams have participated in the play-in tournament. Wow. In its very early existence. And that wow. number could rise to, I think, 20 or 21 if the Sixers end up in the East play-in this year, if a couple of other teams out West end up in the West play-in tournament that have not been there before. So we're talking about two-thirds of the league having already participated in one of the first few years of this tournament. And obviously Adam Silver in the NBA hit some, you know, level of success by adding a little mini playoff, huge winner go home excitement kind of energy and stakes to these pre playoff playoff games. Mm -hmm. And also people said, well, they also, the other reason, not just for ratings and more revenue and, you know, playoff broadcasting kind of money to try to de-incentivize tanking and say, hey, well, you know, maybe if you're in ninth or 10th, kind of in no man's land, you can still find your way to a playoff series, which for teams like the Bulls and Hawks of the East right now is like, hey, we, we might have a shot to be a playoff team despite the fact that we're four or five or six games under 500. We just got to win this game and then win one other game after that. What bugs me is when you look out West and you see the standings out there and you're like, Two teams in the West who have well above 500 records are going to miss the playoffs. They're mm -hmm. just going to miss the playoffs because they don't win their play-in game or games. And meanwhile, you could theoretically have either the Bulls or the Hawks, a well sub-500 team, make their way to the playoffs for what purpose? You mentioned the, you know, the, the right, the prize of playing the Celtics in the first round, Will. What's the point? And people have batted around different ideas of how to maybe tweak the play-in tournament to make it make more sense. Obviously, the logistics of having an East team playing a West team in a first-round series is not ideal, especially if it's like a team in California playing a team on the East Coast and all of the travel problems that that would present for a first-round series. I st It just still bugs me. Like, I do not, I, I want to see Steph and the Warriors, and as much as I dislike them and him, LeBron and the Lakers – in the playoffs, one of the one of those teams for sure ain't going, and the Bulls or Hawks might, and I think that that is royally stupid. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with that concept. I think the the first thing, though, like you you kind of have to like come with some alternatives that that answer the questions that you mentioned, which are like logistics and finances. So, like the way that the NBA is doing this right now. They're making a ton of money on these games. They're getting a ton of extra attention um, and they're giving opportunities to some of these middle class teams. And, you know, that is really good for the teams themselves. Um, I think, you know, I actually was just looking back at this while we were in the ad break. I wrote an article last year on April 6th saying that the NBA playing tournament is a tax on the middle class Chicago Bulls. Like, I do not think that this is good for the Bulls because I think it incentivizes them to stay on the treadmill of mediocrity. I think that's a very bad thing. Um, but like you said, for teams like the Warriors and Lakers, who are going to finish like nine or 10 games over 500 this year, I mean, that sucks that they're not going to be able to get in just because, uh, you know, the rest of the West is better than the bottom of the East. 
And so I think there's probably some ways that you could maneuver it to get some of these better teams in. You know, I think getting rid of conferences or maybe you just have like the eight play uh, play in teams all in their own pool and then you kind of ship them out. Um, but again, that comes into like travel and logistical issues and questions. So I I'm not sure like what the answer is, but I do think, you know, there was something to be said for the way that they did it in the bubble, which was, I think you needed to be within three or four games of the eighth seed in order to qualify for the play in tournament. Mm -hmm. And right now I think the bulls are like eight and a half games out of sixth, they uh, are. something, you know, seven, seven games out of eighth. Like that, right. that's not, that's just not a team that, and the Hawks too, like they're eight games out of eighth place the, the hawks not... are nine and a half games out of six the bulls are eight and a half games meanwhile out west the warriors in 10th are only three games back of sixth place in the west but i think at the end of the day like if they win these games and they earn their way into the playoffs like there's something to be said for that whether or not their record in the regular season reflects them being a good team i think that's what they would argue i don't necessarily agree with it because i think that it gives you know teams like the bulls a chance to get away with deciding to be mediocre. Uh, and I don't like that, but I, I just think that, you know, once they've kind of opened this up and there has been so much money and investment and opportunity and interest in it, like it's hard to, to go back from that and find other ways to now like penalize or take away from these teams. So it's just a tricky question, but I do, I do think there are flaws with it, but if there's one thing about the NBA. It's that they're, open and willing to making changes to improve their product. And so I think that is always going to be on the table for this league. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah, there are flaws in it and they're, they're pretty much flaws in, in everything new that uh, the NBA is trying. I applaud them for trying new things. But at the end of the day, worrying about the Western conference, I don't give a damn if they don't go. So freaking what? I don't <laughs> care. I don't care at all. What am I put their team against up over mine? Are you kidding? Absolutely not. Never, ever will I do that. I am for the Chicago Bulls going every day, every night. I don't care what their record is. If they say they should go, then they should go. If the Warriors say they, if their record say that they should be in there because it's their conference, then they should go. I'm not going to remember their first round series of the Western Conference. I don't give a damn. I'm going to remember their conference finals because I'm thinking about Denver because I'm thinking about uh, OKC and I'm thinking about uh, Dallas and I'm thinking about those teams. But if their bottom teams uh, end up getting there, congratulations. I'll give you an applause. When the Lakers ended up there after doing it in the play-in, they got to the Western Conference Finals and they played uh, Denver and got their ass stomped. Like, how fun was that? <laughs> like, it wasn't fun for me, like, at all. They got their ass whooped. Care about their record? Like, they're just going, that's the conference that they're in. That is the hand that they are dealt. Is it fair? No, it's not. Is life fair? No, it's not. That's just how it is, man. But that's how it is in the conference, man. The Eastern Conference has been um, an exercise in futility at that bottom part for about 20 years. It's been like that. But also out of that futility, I watched the Heat go to the finals last year, strictly out of that futility. So I don't care if that's your thing. If that's you in the Western Conference and that's your squad, I'm sure you feel differently to me. And that's how it should be because I'm a fan. And I'm a fan of the Chicago Bulls. So if it's at a detriment to my team, Hell no. I don't care, dog. I'm for the Bulls. Uh, R.I. Fish in the comments saying, isn't it just the general disparity between the East and West uh, that's been going on for decades? They used to just miss the uh, miss the postseason entirely. Um, yeah. And, uh, by the way, shout out to our good friend, John Sabine. Abolish the East. Uh, the, the East and Western <laughs> Conference you know, disparity has, has been kind of ongoing for a while now. And, and that's part of the problem as we are about to see two you know, strong teams out West miss the playoffs where maybe we see a limping team in the East. And like ba back when the NBA was smaller, they, you know, hadn't had an expansion to 30 teams or even when they did expand to 30 teams and some of those teams in the league were trash, you would see eight seeded teams, maybe even seven seeded teams that were win totals in the thirties, the, the mid thirties, the high thirties, like even the, like the, young MJ Bulls, his rookie year, I think were a 30 something win team that went to the first 32. round. 32. <laughs> yeah, so like that that has existed in previous generations of NBA basketball and NBA postseason. And I I think for the most part, what the league has done with this playing tournament adds excitement. I just like like you said, Will, they've made strides, whether it's Silver or the people he works with, to always be changing and trying new things to to you know improve their product. 
for, for NBA fans. So keep working on it because there, I'm sure you can come up with some other entertaining night of NBA stuff that NBA fans would tune in to watch. If we all still sit there and watch some of the dumb shit that happens All-Star Weekend, <laughs> hey, come up with something at least as good or maybe better than that, and then also simultaneously say, if just hypothetically, and, and I know it's it's not likely at all, but what I think as someone who, yes, Dave, I agree, I am a Bulls fan. And I am a Bulls fan from October to April. And I'm a Bulls fan 365 days a year. Yes, you are. Going, going through seasons like this as a Bulls fan, my reward is watching good teams play in the playoffs. That's mm -hmm. what I want to see. I would rather watch good play, uh, you know, a good first round series between two good Western Conference teams than watch the Bulls get waxed by the Boston Celtics in the first round. And that is honest, honest truth. In this case of the Eastern standings this season, Bulls and Hawks, I think that there should be a rule that if you are an under 500 team after playing all 82 and you are five games back, let's say, of the eighth mm -hmm. seed, mm -hmm. you don't get a play-in game. I'm sorry, you didn't earn it. That's why the league used to cut the playoffs at eight. And they still cut the real playoffs at eight. Like you said, Will, they kind of did a version of that in the bubble. You got to be this many games within the playoffs to be here. They they told the Bulls, no thanks, don't come to Florida. But, like, what what is the point? What is the point of the Bulls and the Hawks being in this play-in tournament when they, they are that far behind even the eighth-seeded team? They don't deserve to be there. But, see, that's where we're always going to differ because I would much rather watch my Bulls team than any other team in the playoffs. I don't give a damn about these other teams. I don't care. So what? I watch them have a six-game series. Yay! I don't give a crap. That that means nothing to me. Like, are they gonna unless they're doing something or have someone that's doing something historic? If somebody's gonna average like fifty in the series, okay, then I could give you that argument there. But that ain't happening. All that's happening is guys going out for one, four, two. That's it. That's all that's happening. Is that we're not seeing nothing spectacular? You're not seeing nothing special. You're not seeing triple overtimes every time. You're not. You're just seeing them. those teams lose. I'd rather my, watch my team do that. We can do that. We can go out there and do that. I'm for the Bulls, bro. I don't care about these other teams. That's the bottom line of it for me. That's my reward, Matt. Is For me, that's the reward is I want to see my squad. And I feel how you feel, and I understand how you feel. You're right. And I'm not saying how your feelings are wrong. You know, you feel how you feel. But for me, that's how I want it, bro. I am always going to be for the Bulls in the playoffs over it. Other of the other 29 teams that are, that are uh, up for it. I want the Bulls top, on top, period. I think the other way you could think about this is, okay, now there's this sort of uneven incentive to push for the middle, push for the back end of the playoffs. What if there was now, you know, they brought in another external variable to pull teams back towards, not like tanking, but incentivizing teams that like, not, I guess, not penalizing teams for trying to be middle class, right? So how can you say, all right, maybe you got to the play in and you lost, or maybe you got to the first round and, and got swept, but like, should you be rewarded for that? Or should you be penalized by that? You know, you get your playing gate revenue. That's obviously a reward for the team and for the ownership group, but that doesn't necessarily reward the fans. So what can you do to try to help? Like, I don't know if it's improved play uh, lottery odds, where if you don't, get in like they've flattened lottery odds a couple of years ago to make it so that teams could jump up from a little bit higher. Maybe you flatten mm -hmm. them even more to now de-incentivize mm -hmm. tanking and incentivize teams to win while still giving them an opportunity to draft at a high pick, you know, without having to tell them, no, you can't try to compete right now. Like, I think that's, th there's another direction that you could go with this that incentivizes um, teams to continue to compete without like encouraging them or uh, getting them trapped on the treadmill of mediocrity. Because I think that's that's kind of the real issue here is like, it's not good for anybody to be stuck in the middle. Like, I think that's universally agreed upon. The question mm -hmm. is like, how do you, how do you promote co competition without uh, incentivizing tanking? And I think there's, there's some things that you could probably try to do, whether it's flattening mm -hmm. the lottery odds or, you know, whatever it is, I, I'm not sure, but there's, there's gotta be something you could do 
that could pull it back the other way without necessarily discouraging tanking. Because the other thing is a lot of these teams now, like the Bulls, for example, say, oh, we're in the ninth seed. Like, I don't want to make any selling trades. So we can we can keep competing. Well, that just means there's less activity. There's less less trade movement in the entire league. And I think that's a bad thing for the league. Mm-hmm. The league really generates a ton of interest and excitement around the trade deadline. And now this year, there was like nothing that happened. There was no excitement. There was no major changes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Pascal Siakam was like the biggest name. And with all due respect, that's like just not Kevin uh, Durant from the year before. So how dare you? The know. biggest name was Daniel Gafford, Will. <laughs> look, dare at you, these, Will. look at these this maps. Clinch, clinch the top six seed <laughs> with go. their win last night. <laughs> Good for Luca. PJ Washington, stand up, baby. <laughs> Yeah, man, I, I hear all that. I, and Will, and, and my thing is, what I'm hearing is what you're saying, you can do all that incentivizing, but for me and, and bad GMs are going to be bad GMs. Like, trash trash is going to be trash. And guys who are comfortable with mediocrity are going to find a way to be comfortable with mediocrity. Mm-hmm. Um, you can you can change things, incentivize, you can do all that stuff. They're going to find a way to do it their way. And I don't care if it's working hard or doing nothing at all. They're going to find a way to do it their way. You know what I'm saying? Unfortunately, we're in a place where our front office is comfortable in that mediocrity and comfortable in that middle. And it sucks ass. Yes, it does. Um, But I don't think even if you incentivize and change things that they would immediately become great at what they do and start making these great moves and making guys compete and then making them do all that and this and that. I think they just might get leapfrogged, you know what I'm saying, like by somebody else who might get feel like incentivized by it, man. They are who they are. And unfortunately, we're in a ass position, you know what I'm saying, uh, with this front office. So I think it's more front office and GM stuff than than it is the league, you know, changing and incentivizing things. Yeah, I think I think that's fair, but I also think Bulls are who we thought they were. I think <laughs> Let them off the hook, man. <laughs> but I also think that. You know, if you said there is a monetary incentive for teams that make the playoffs but don't make the play in or like that, mm-hmm. that, you know, there, there's got there's just at a certain point, like it, it comes down to dollars. Right. And if there's no incentive yeah. to making the play in, then teams aren't going to be as focused on that and they'll be focused towards mm-hmm. other things. So well, wait, I, they, they... I agree with you for the most part, but I do think there's like some wiggle room there where if you put in some guardrails to prevent against teams from being mediocre because that's not good for the league either. Like it's not good no. for the league when teams are mid. So I think, I think there's always stuff you can try, but I, I do agree that like at a certain yeah. point, this is just who you are and you're going to have to deal with it and, you know, figure out another way. And whether that's like lottery luck or, you know, just missing the playoffs two out of three years for the rest of time, then that's what it is. And we, we, we just saw them put in a whole new tournament to incentivize guys to actually start caring. Did the Bulls look like they cared more? Like, they just were still that. They still they were the ones complaining that teams were running up scores on them. Like, it, they are who they are, man. You know what I'm saying? They're going to be who they be. Like, you, you offer them what you're going to offer them, but they are who they are. Uh, Fish in the comments saying, it sucks a little bit for the 7 and 8 teams. And I, I do feel, like, bad for teams say in Miami or Philly shoes where it's like, Hey, we, we got 10 more wins in an 82 game season than these, you know, teams in Chicago and Atlanta. You're telling us we got to play them to punch our ticket to the playoffs. Yep. Cause, Cause that's BS. <laughs> but then, I mean, you could also just flip that on its head and be like, okay, well, if you feel like you are that much of a better team, then go beat them and then go to the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, you know, it, I, I guess it goes both ways. Uh, all right. We got to take our second ad break and then we will come back and shift gears uh, and talk a little bit about this uh, Andre Drummond injury that might uh, put the the newest, rustiest wrench in Billy Donovan's <laughs> plans for what the hell this team and its rotation looks like for the remainder of this season. While we were doing that, hit the thumb if you didn't do it the first time around. Uh, help us grow the channel with your likes. Um, also, make sure you subscribe to CSGO Sports. Today's CSGO Bulls brought to you by Circa Sportsbook. So many fun things to be betting on in the world of sports in the coming days and weeks. Obviously, you know, baseball season is here. Shout out to our guy, Cody, 
see Joe Cubs, who's just making freaking bets on bets on bets every Cubs yes, game day. Uh, we also, as I said, we got the Masters coming up this weekend and NBA and NHL playoffs right around the corner. Circus Sportsbook always has those tight money line splits and their low hold model. Striving to always have those starting out odds for whatever you're betting on. Basketball, baseball, hockey, uh, game spreads, point total over-unders, whatever it is, at minus 110 odds out of the gate. Unlike a lot of other sports bettors these days who are using an opportunity because, hey, we set the lines, pushing those starting odds at 115 or 120 for no good reason. Circa also keeps as little money as possible on large market bets like futures, golf tournaments, Great example. Get your bets in on what's going to happen to the Masters today before the tourney starts because Circa is the place where you can get the best odds and best values on those kind of bets. They also have the best customer service in the sports betting business. Real people behind that Circa Sports brand and their app who resolve any issues you might have in a timely fashion, unlike those other sports books who use the dreaded chatbots. Don't get me started. Chatbot customer service, AI. We're all we're all going down, but not Circa. <laughs> Circa will stand and fight. All aspects of their app are being run by the same team <laughs> that run the main Circa Sportsbook at Circa Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. Oh. Man, I was just daydreaming yesterday about being back at Stadium with Swim at Circa this summer. Which you know, knock on wood, hopefully that's where we'll be again for NBA so summer league. Sunburned. Oh my god! I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you remember the one show we did from Stadium Swim? Um, I think it was like our second or third day there, and it was like early afternoon. The sun was just pummeling us on our little makeshift setup at one of those, you know, cabanas from the poolside. Shout yep, out to our guy RG who so came and just sprayed me with an extra layer of sunscreen while we were doing our show. But yeah, Will, you so did get burned. <laughs> Uh, download that Circus Sports Illinois app at circusports.com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Be sure to look, uh, be on the lookout for circus events, watch parties, and tailgates. If you or someone you know may have a gambling problem, call 1 800 Gambler. That's 1 800 426 2537. Text GAMB to 833 234 or visit are you really winning.com. And please, someone send Goat some sunscreen. Send that man SPF 1000. Hit them up, baby. I want to, I want to read y'all something. Uh, somebody sent me on Twitter. Um, name is Sergeant Hopeman, and he says he's been a big Bulls fan uh, since the 90s, and he's from Germany. Uh, he says he listens to us all the time, says we are great, and he's listened to every podcast we've ever made. says, wow. pure fire. Wow. Says, pure fire. And then he asks, is it possible to become a member of CHGO and get some merch stuff? Well, <laughs> sir, What? Absolutely, it is possible for you to do that and to become a diehard, ladies and gentlemen. So you can do like my man, Sergeant Hopeman, and become a diehard and join us in this awesomeness that is CHGO. What you're going to get is those podcasts and live shows on every team every day. Of course, you're going to get the post game shows. Of course, you're going to get that premium written content. For all the members at allchgo.com, because you know GOAT has got some premium content only for the die hearts, you're going to get 20% off of every event that we got. That includes the Chicago Bears live draft show that is taking place at Joe's on Weed Street Thursday on the 25th and Friday on the 26th. You get 20% off of those events at any other tailgate. Uh, watch for anything that we do takeovers you get 20 percent off all that y'all get dope merch for all your teams which includes a free t-shirt when you sign up and a free t-shirt every single year that you continue to be a diehard roller with us y'all how amazing is that and of course you get the members only discord in the, what we call the chg Oh, Lounge. We just started a CHGO wrestling one to go along with everything else that we're doing. So it's something for everybody there. You all just come on in, hang out, have a great time. Find which one that you want to get into. Or if you want to get into all of them, you can do all of those things, man. The communities are awesome. The fans are awesome. The people who enjoy us are awesome. So y'all go ahead and be awesome, man. Sign up at allchgo.com and become a diehard and hang with us. Woo! <clears throat> I think uh, the CSGO Bears draft party Thursday night is already sold out. 
Um, Sold out. They, they yeah. do have a waiting list, though, if you want to just put your name down on the waiting list. I do think there are maybe a few tickets left uh, for the second night on Friday. Um, looking forward to that. Going to be a good time. Dude, Very gone to the new era for Paris football. Think about Caleb every day. <laughs> uh, all right. So with our remaining time, wanted to touch on the Andre Drummond injury from the dumbest play in the NBA this season. Well, I guess it came on the heels of the dumbest play in the NBA this season. Um and the fact that he might be not uh, available. Um, ooh, wow. Just well, breaking news. Woj, Woj bomb on the side here. From, All right. Uh, yeah. Just now, after arriving in a blockbuster offseason trade, Celtics guard Drew Holiday has agreed on a four year, $135 million contract extension. Ooh, wow. He's comfortable. Man. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Oh, and the rich get richer. How nice. <laughs> the rich get richer, yes. Well, yeah, whether that gets... comment is in regard to Drew Holiday or the Boston Celtics, take your pick. <laughs> Meanwhile, right. we're talking about, hey, should Billy play Javante or Adama Sonogo <laughs> if Andre Drummond can't play? I don't know, but team's been doing things. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, because, look, Uh-oh. we saw we – saw um, Billy leaned heavy on Vooch minutes in their loss to the Knicks last night after Drummond left uh, with that sprained ankle. W- what do you think, Will? What do you think Billy will do? What do you think Billy should do when it comes to filling in the gap if Drummond cannot, in fact, play their last three regular season games, the playing game against the Hawks? What What do you do? Well, I think a lot of it is going to be matchup based. I mean, you're not in a situation where you have like the talent to be able to dictate matchups and and determine what the other team does to counter you. So I think a lot of this is just going to depend on who they're playing against. And so you look at the rest of their schedule. They've obviously got Detroit, Washington and New York. Last night we saw Adama Sonogo in the four minutes to give Vooch a break because we're, they're facing a team with Isaiah Hartenstein and Mitchell Robinson. You can't really go small against a a front court like that. Maybe against Detroit, you have a similar issue where they've got, you know, Duran and Isaiah Stewart in the front court playing a lot of minutes together. Like it's going to be hard to go small against that kind of team, but maybe against the Wizards, you see them go a little bit small. Um, Obviously, as we talked about last night, Terry Taylor was waived in order to make room for Javante Green. So there's no third string center. There's no small ball center. Uh, that is just kind of rough timing, but what do you do? You got to get creative. You got to go with probably Tory Craig and Javante green front line mm. together. Um, I kind of want to see Dalen Terry play some five because he oh! cannot shoot, but wow. he's, he's probably the biggest one of all of them, like in terms mm. of strength and in terms of height, um, it puts you in a position where you can switch a lot of stuff. Now in order to go small. And the reason I advocate for it when I do is because it allows you to get your best like most skilled players on the court. And the problem for the Bulls is they don't have like this plethora of, you know, shot creating, ball moving, athletic wings that they can go to. So it's not like you, you're you out there with lineups where you like add a ton of shooting and now you can get away with Dalen out there. So like, who do you go to? You've got Kobe, you've got Io, you've got Caruso, you've got Damar and you've got Dalen. Like, I think that could work, but there's still not a lot of shooting out there. You're just switching everything. Can you get away with that against some teams? Probably can you get away with it against a team like the Pistons or uh, the Knicks? Probably not. So there's going to be some opportunities, I think, for Billy to get creative. But I think for the most part, it's just going to be Vooch playing like 38, 38, 38, 39, 40 minutes a game. Uh, mm-hmm. And, and uh, Adama Sanogo playing in short spurts to kind of give him a break with maybe, you know, a curveball, small ball lineup in there at some point. But I really do think a lot of it is just going to depend on matchups. And, you know, there's a chance Drummond's just back. I, I was pretty skeptical of that, but... Again, the fact that he's listed as doubtful with an ankle sprain on the injury report, I think is a good sign. We haven't heard anything from the team as far as updates on his health. There was, you know, nothing, no messaging from uh to the media about imaging done or 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 larger term issues. So hopefully Drummond's just not out that long and they don't have to worry about it. But uh you you do have to like get yourself prepared because you got three games and four yeah. nights here to end the season. And well, they didn't say uh what what grade of a sprain it was either, correct? <laughs> No, Billy just immediately said, like, I don't know the severity of it. He tried to get it retaped in order to come back in the game, uh, mm-hmm. is what Billy said. But, you know, based on what we saw, him getting wheeled off in a wheelchair, him leaving the game early in a scooter, that's not a good sign in terms of him being able to play last night. 
Now, this is, I think I said this last night, but like, this is not a scenario where you're like playing pickup and you land on someone's foot and you're out for three weeks because you rolled your ankle coming down on someone's foot. Like, this is the NBA. They've got incredible training. Their treatment is like 24 hours a day. Like, they can heal you up quicker than you think with an ankle sprain, but that was a really bad one. He's a big guy. He came down with a lot of weight on that. So, I don't see the incentive to bring him back. Like you basically just need to win two of these next three games against the, the Pistons and the Knicks in order to secure the ninth seed. I'm not too worried about them falling to 10 at this point, like rather just get healthy and like try to get away with whatever you can at the backup five of these next three games um, rather than kind of rush him back and just try to win at all costs. So to me, you just, you get creative where you can. Otherwise it's just going to be a Damas and Ogo time. Yeah. Uh, I got another question for you. Will. Um, when you mentioned Dalen Terry, were you and I, trust me, I'm not saying he, he's this player, but were you thinking on like a Draymond Green kind of level, like just a guy who can get the rebound, start the break, you know what I mean? Run, run a fast break very well. Just be an irritant kind of guy. Sort of. I mean, Draymond, what makes him special as a five is he obviously can run the break, but he's also kind of your point guard and you have these like off ball moving off guard you know, shooters coming off of screens, running split actions, getting back cuts, and he's able to be an incredible passer. So I think you you can sure. do some of that. But, uh, you know, what we've seen from Dalen when he's been in there is some setting some screens and being a roller and a playmaker out of that. That's kind of a Draymond-esque role that I think fits with Dalen's skill set, where he's an athlete, he can get downhill, but he's also a good passer, but he can't really unlock those passing skills if he's having to create off the dribble. So now you put him in a short roll situation where he's playing four on three, you get him an opportunity to kind of make use of his passing. So I, I just, I think that could work. And obviously he's a great rebounder. Uh, he can really defend up. Um, there's some following issues where he's going to get into some foul trouble at times, but I would be down to try that and just see what it looks like because, you know, Dalen's a, a young player, but he's, he's finishing up his second season in the league. Uh, second of four years on his resale contract. You kind of got to see what he's going to be able to do with some more opportunity at a certain point, like these games, they just don't, I, I, they're not super high stakes at this point. Obviously when you get into the play in that changes, but um, I just kind of want to see what he can do with more minutes in a role where he doesn't have to create, but he also doesn't have to be a floor spacer. And I think that kind of fits mm -hmm. what he can do. Mm, thank you. Andrew in the comments saying Dalen in the Tucker spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the man's Nigel in the comments saying Trey Young about to drop 32 in his return. Um, yeah, we, we touched on that earlier. Sounds like Trey Young might uh, might be coming back, you know, ASAP and available mm -hmm. for the Hawks in that playing game against the Bulls uh, next week. Looking specifically at that Atlanta matchup, Will, if in fact Drummond's ankle, if they can't get get him to go, because I, you know, I do think that by and large you're right. Does these NBA teams with their medical staffs, like, they can get a guy healthy enough to play a game uh, and, and expedite that process if you need to. But I. I hear and feel millions of Bulls fans all around the world roaring their eyes and saying, well, not the Bulls medical staff. Um, so let's just say, for argument's sake, we, they don't have drum, Drummond in the playing in tournament. The Hawks without Trey have usually been rolling out the starting lineup of DeJounte, um, DeAndre Hunter, Jalen Johnson, since he came back from his injury, Bogdanovich, and Capella. So what do you think the Hawks uh, do? You know, Trey back into the starting lineup who leaves the starting lineup and then given Atlanta's size, you know, like uh, DeAndre and Jalen are both 6'8", Capella's 6'10", 6'11", maybe. They do still have some more size off their bench. Bruno Fernando, who actually did some good minutes for them in the Bulls' last game against Atlanta. What, what do you think uh, that matchup specifically would look like if the Bulls are still missing Drummond's size and Trey is back in that starting lineup? Yeah, they've also got Anyaka Kangwu, who has been out with injury, but I think he's trending towards a return here soon. Um, More size. You know, I, I got to be honest, like, I don't really know how much teams are really, like, game planning for a backup center. So I don't really think that this is going to be, like, a thing where they're changing what they do or who they are to adapt to the Bulls not having Andre Drummond. But, you know, what this does do is erase the opportunity for the Bulls to go with that too big lineup. And as much as, you know, we've quibbled with it and... Uh, you know, suggested that it's probably not a great long-term solution. It has been productive at times. They offensive rebound the hell out of the ball and they give themselves more opportunities. But I think more importantly, they are able to get teams out of their rhythm and force them to really worry about two 
players coming down to offensive rebound that takes them out of transition opportunities and that can really change what you have to do against this team. And the Bulls have gone heavily with that lineup in the last two times that they played the Hawks. So um, I, I really do think the Hawks benefit from the Bulls not having Drummond just because he's been really productive against them. I think he had his like 2020 game against them when he started in place of Vucha. He's really dominated the Hawks. I think that's a great thing if you're the Atlanta Hawks. Um, but I don't think they're going to now come in with two bigs and try to counter it. I think they'll just like still see if they can turn the corner on Vooch and pick and rolls, throw a bunch of lobs to Capella, try to get Vooch in foul trouble, and then, you know, see what they can do against some of these smaller lineups. But the Hawks are a team where like you do have a lot of, they've, they've got a ton of injuries too, but they've got bigger wings that can shoot, that can attack, you know, DeAndre Hunter, Jalen Johnson, uh, Bogdanovich, Trey, obviously DeJounte, like those guys can get downhill. Those guys can create and, you know, attack closeouts. And so I think they're just going to be looking for opportunities to put pressure on Vooch, try to get him into foul trouble and then make the Bulls scramble a little bit. Mm -hmm. Can't forget about their MVP, Creechy. Just <laughs> well, he is actually, I believe, on a two-way contract, and they need to either waive somebody to promote him so that he's playoff eligible, or I don't think he will be able to play in the playoffs. I believe that's wow. correct. Um, Good news for the Bulls. <laughs> while somebody else is talking, but um, they've got a couple of games to figure out what to do with him. Oh, well, well what is it um, about the Hawks that the Bulls actually match up so well against them because if you looked at it on paper it doesn't seem like it would be the case because the bulls are obviously the smaller team and like they're just the hawks are just full of wings with lemon pepper like and, and they out here killing they should be looks like on paper they should be killing the bulls but they just always have struggle against them man like what what is the reason for that well i think you know the bulls are able to pick on trey young quite a lot same as a lot of other teams where you know DeMar has the ball at the top of the key. He says, who's Trey Young guarding? Uh, I'll come on up here, set a screen for me. I'm going to get this switch, and I'm going to go to work and basically get either two points on an uncontested jump shot or two points at the free throw line. Uh, you put them in just a really tough spot with the way that he defends. I mean, they are just – they're and Trey, like a lot of people are talking about Trey, you know, improving defensively this year and, and taking strides to – uh, give more effort on that end. Like they're still doing what the Bulls are doing with Vooch in terms of insulating against him and putting together a scheme that can just try to not make him such a target. Um, you know, they've been so much better defensively with Bogdanovich, who's not a good defender in place of Trey Young, just because he's a little bit bigger and he gives more effort and he doesn't just like let you. I mean, there were so many possessions in those first two games where Trey was playing where he was like, he got a switch and then he just left because he didn't want to guard the guy. He didn't want to be on the island against Demar, so he just like left and let Demar take a shot or whoever it was. So um, I think he really does kill you defensively. And I think that's something the Bulls can take advantage of. That's something that Demar has been really good at and really aggressive doing, especially post All Star break. Here is just like getting the ball in his hands, picking on matchups, and getting to his spots. Uh, so I think that's something the Bulls can really take advantage of. But you know, the other thing is you look at their last game and it was this conversation that we've had for three years now, which is you're not going to outshoot somebody from deep and you're giving up a ton of threes. So if it's a night where they're making everything like good luck, because that's just how it is. And I think that's one of the interesting pieces of this play in tournament, which is that it's a one game sample size. If right. Vic Creechie makes six threes in the first half, you're probably going to win that game just because it's going to be tough to overcome that if you're a Bulls team that doesn't shoot any threes. So if it's a game where he goes 0 for 6, which could happen in a one-game sample, this is not a seven-game series where those things even out, well, maybe the Bulls get an easy win. So it's just, there's, like, you can game plan it, you can think about matchups, you can think about strengths and weaknesses and picking on things, but at the end of the day, like, in a one-game single elimination thing, so much of it just comes down to variance and whether the ball goes in. And I think that's why the NCAA tournament is so exciting. It's why the play-in tournament has been a success from the NBA standpoint, but it's also why once you get into the playoffs, it's about a seven game series because in a seven game series, the better team typically wins. And I think that's what you want at the end of the day is the best team winning the championship. Sure. But the play-in tourney games, cage match, Dave, cage, cage match. match. Hail uh, in the snail. <laughs> 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 that, that is it we are out of time for today thank you everybody for tuning in hit the like button on your way out if you haven't done it yet shout out and appreciation to our producer for the day kevin wells hey. behind the scenes 
Uh, Bulls Pistons 6 p.m. Central tip off tomorrow night front end of their back to back Bulls trying to prevent the Pistons from taking that season series which the Pistons currently lead two games to one two of the Pistons 13 wins this season against our beloved Bulls <laughs> uh we will have pregame at 5 30 central time in Stu- live in the studio we will see you then in the meantime follow will the go will underscore godly big dave is at bow b-a-w-l sports on bulls underscore peck we are chgo underscore bulls just inching closer hour by hour day by day to the drama of the playing tournament uh we'll talk to you for free game tomorrow night y'all take it easy bulls nation see red be good Peace. We all silly like the mayor. 